Okay, well, we're going from strokes to soft tissue injuries. So a big leap, aren't we? Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, caring for soft tissue injuries. Not going to tell you anything that you don't know, but hopefully we'll have a conversation about how to optimize your, the care of the injuries that you see in the emergency department. You know, this is sort of the bread and butter. We see lots of soft tissue injuries in, in the emergency department. So, first of all, and this is a great graph, you know, we all know what a strain is comp composed or compared to a sprain. And uh, this is a great graph you can actually use uh, to show your patients because they don't understand the difference between a strain and a sprain. So, uh, and there's a great picture here in terms of showing the difference between the two. Also, this graph, the West Point Sprain Grading System, is also a great way of, of, of categorizing the, uh, the kind of injury that you have. So grade one through grade three shows the amount of tearing and swelling and the instability of the joint and whether there ought to be some weight bearing. So a, a, nice, a nice table there. So when we're talking about closed soft tissue injuries, we're going to use the mnemonic for our conversation of Pricer. So we'll be going through that. And the first thing is with, with all closed soft tissue injuries, we need to protect the injury you know, at all costs. Um, this often involves immobilization. And remember, in the, in the old days, we, we used to cast people and put them in splints for weeks and weeks. And we found out that that, that caused more harm than good. So we want, to, we, we, uh, we want to immobilize them for the shortest period of time, um, either by splints or crutches or whatever, uh, but we're going get, to get them up and moving fairly quickly. But we need to protect the injury. The second, the R, is to rest the involved area. Again, not for very long. Um, as I said, excessive immobilization really can result in joint stiffness, particularly you know, in the elderly. So we want to get early mobilization, at least in the pain-free range, is certainly encouraged. So protect the injury, uh, and then rest the involved area, and then get them up and moving uh, as quickly as we can, as safely as we can. Ice. So we found out that, that we don't want to put ice directly on the skin. I mean, how many times have we seen someone at home who has actually put very, very ice and other cold material on an area and left it for a long period of time and we ended up having a lot of tissue damage. So um, we want to make sure that the area is covered with a towel. Um, you know, a lot of people like to use frozen peas that will kind of conform to the injury. Um, I actually like frozen corn better. Thank you. You know, I never get a laugh when I do that. I guess I'm going to have to take that out of, out of my, my talk here. My wife laughs at it, and I guess that's good enough. Okay, anyway, frozen peas or corn, uh, you know, it'll conform to the injury, um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's usually readily available at home. Shouldn't apply ice no more than 30 minutes at a time. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of con controversy about the use of ice. You know, if you use it wisely, you know, for short durations, it does great work. Um, uh, so, then the next one is compression. So we want to reduce the edema, we want to disperse any excessive tissue fluid, you know, and it really aids in, in, uh, in venous return. So again, make sure that the, that the pressure is greater distally than proximally, otherwise you're going to end up with the tourniquet. Okay, so ice, ice compression, the next one is elevation. Again, that helps reduce the edema, try to, you know, uh, uh, elevate the injured part above the heart, um, and a lot of people say you can do some compression and elevation at the same time. Um, you know, whatever seems to work in terms of, of getting the maximal benefit. And this usually occurs within the first 72 hours. After that, there's probably not any need for this. And then the R is for rehabilitation. Again, as we talked about, we want to do that as quickly as we can and as safe as we can. And people are going to have better rehab if they're up and walking around or, or using, using the injured area. So... Um, and particularly around joints. We want to get the joints moving as quickly as we can, particularly with, with shoulder, shoulder injuries. Okay, well, what about laceration management? You know, something, again, bread and butter in the emergency department, um, you know, taking, taking lacerations. And the, probably the most important thing that I want to talk about in taking care of lacerations is cleaning, is, is uh, getting the debris out of the laceration itself. So, and we know that lacerations can't really be adequately cleansed without performing some anesthesia. So, 
um, you know, so we, we have a high priority regarding anesthetizing the area as soon as the patient arrives. I, I remember times when you're in a busy emergency department, somebody comes in with a laceration, you know, you, you, you get a big, a big uh, tub of betadine, stick their arm in it for like a half an hour while you're doing, seeing other patients. Um, we, we don't do that anymore. That's not a good thing to do. Um, we we want to we wanna get them anesthetized, um, and, um, which, by the way, is going to relieve the pain, help stop the bleeding, and, and uh, um, obviously we need to do a, a functional neuro exam before we do anesthesia. But anyway, um, if you do use betadine, you, you may want to dilute it somewhat to about, you know, about 1%. But the, the wounds, wounds that are really dirty, you can actually get them over you know, to the sink or whatever. Um, some believe that a pulsatile jet irrigation is a particularly effective way. We'll talk about that in a minute. I think it's really, really valuable to try to get the debris out of the wound. So what about what you, once you're seeing a patient with a laceration, it's really important what you say to the patient, probably more important what you say to the person who's with the patient. Um, and it's, I think it's smart uh, while, you're ta while you're cleaning the wound and anesthetizing the wound to talk to them, you know, like, I'm going to do my best to make sure you have as little discomfort as possible to reassure the patient. Um, they're always worried about debris that's in the wound. Let them know that you're cleaning the wound very thoroughly and let them know that you're trying to, to, to remove all the foreign material that you can. Uh, it, and also, it, it's a, there's a chance that we can't get it all. And I'll tell you a story in a minute about that. Um, or if it's a deep laceration, you know, I don't see any evidence of a tendon or nerve injury, um, you know, so talking to the patient. Um, and also about wounds. I always let them know that wounds always heal, but sometimes, you know, there's a scar that, that's there. So prepare them. Okay. Well, I'll tell you a quick story. I did an expert witness case a number of years ago in Arizona where this 50-year-old guy was up on his roof cleaning the leaves off, the, the, the gutters up there, and then when he's coming down the ladder, he fell, and he lacerated, you know, the top part of his foot, just gaping open with leaves and grass and everything in it, and uh, so he, they called the ambulance, brought him over to the emergency center, and uh, the doc and the PA saw, saw the patient, anesthetized it, cleaned it out using pulsatile jets, got an x-ray, um, you know, and uh, in, a, in a teamwork effect, both the PA and the doc had looked at this wound a number of times, cleaned it out the best you could, and, and then closed it and got him set up to see, you know, a, a, a foot doctor within a couple of days. Um, after the patient left, the x-ray came back, and, and uh, the radiologist said, well, there, there, there appears to be some particulate matter on the x-ray, you know, but nothing conci concise because it's an x-ray. You know, it could be a lot of different things, but they didn't think much about it. Well, the, patient, the patient's foot got red and hot, and within a day or two, um, actually saw a podiatrist who opened it up and then made comments some, about some black, black particulate matter, you know, in the wound. You know, who knows what that was. Anyway, ended up seeing another surgeon, and two or three surgeries later, found out, and, and with some, some cultures, found out that the guy really had a really bad fungal infection, you know, in, in the foot. Well... Long story short, ended up suing the hospital, the PA, and, and the doc um, because of the particulate matter was there, even though they did everything right in terms of talking with the patient and, and trying to do the best they can in terms of getting anything out of the wound. And, and, and it was never settled. It actually went to court. And once it got to court, actually the, the jury, you know, found, in, you know, in favor of the doc in the hospital. So, and this guy was fairly wealthy, but it went through, you know, two years of, of if you've ever been if you've ever been in a malpractice suit, you know it's not a fun thing. So two two years of that, and then finally, um, you know, have it have it come in favor of the doc. But anyway, the point I'm making there, even if you do everything right, these things can happen. But make sure that you document and that you talk to the patient, and document that you've talked to the patient about you know things that that uh, when you clean the wound out. Talking about getting back to uh, about anesthetizing, um, uh, uh, so Marcane versus xylocaine. So they're, they're relatively equivalent. You see here, you know, 0.25%. Uh, uh, Marcane is about 1% lidocaine. The onset of action with lidocaine may be slightly faster, uh, but not really of any cl clinical significance. Uh, Marcane may decrease the need for post-procedure anesthesia as well, uh, compared to the short-acting one. 
So here's a great graph in terms of local anesthetic, both lidocaine and lidocaine with epi, and, uh, and the rest shows the formulations, the duration of action, and the maximum dosage. It's a great graph to have um, in, uh, in your records. Okay, so some other local anesthesia tricks. So if you, if you can warm up the, an the anesthetic, it's less painful when you inject it. So you may want to take that bottle, put it in your pocket for a while, get a little warm. Um, you know, also alkalized lidocaine um, using about one milliliter of bicarbonate uh, to 10 milliliters of lidocaine also is less painful when it's injected. So it does raise the pH a little bit, works faster when that happens. You may have to get the pharmacist to, to make a bottle of that for you and label it correctly but it works pretty good and it reduces, as, as I said, the amount of pain when you inject. So obviously, we, and we've learned this, using a small gauge needle, about 27 or 30 um, you know, in your ED, and it, once you've, you've injected this, you want to inject it slowly. I don't know about you, but when I first started, I remember you know, putting a lot of pressure on there and just blowing that, you know, the needle off of the syringe. So injecting it slowly, um, it, it, as well as, as if you go too fast, you're going to get a lot of swelling in the tissue. Um, also, once you're in there, you want to be able to move the needle around while you're in there rather than pulling it out and, and re-sticking the area. So, so injecting through the open wound edge, is, is, uh, you'll, get, you'll get better anesthesia and certainly less pain. Also, if you really want to be good at lacerations, you really need to obviously know your anatomy um, and look at the regional nerve blocks. In this particular one, you're looking at the nerve blocks for the face, and if you, if you uh, sew up lacerations on the face, you can actually anesthetize some large area with minimal amounts of local anesthesia that works really well. Um, if you, and obviously, if, if this is something that you, that you like to do, make sure that you do a lot of them. Um, you know, and, and feel really comfortable with it. Otherwise, you may have to call in a specialist. Same thing with the parotid duct. Um, here's the, the facial nerve proximity. You can see where that is. Uh, again, knowing the anatomy, knowing where the, the nerves are and where you want to put the block in is really important. Okay, some tips about facial lacerations. Obviously, we've, we've known forever, don't shave the eyebrows, you know. I had a student with me once, I asked uh, them to go in and, and sort of cleanse the area and get it ready, and, and uh, he shaved off the, uh, the eyebrow. And uh, I came in and I thought, there it goes. You know, the good news, it grew, it grew back. You know, I was calling the guy every day, you know, how's, how's your eyebrow? But, uh, you know, so, you know, they always say it may not grow back, and I've, I've never seen that, but it worries me. Um, also with the eyelid, you know, lacerations, you know, you may want to consider getting a specialist, but, uh, you know, especially if it, if it transects the margins, because the alignment of the two sections really need to be perfect, you know, and uh, especially as you get older and you need to wear glasses or you, you need to be able to see, you know, what you're doing to make sure that you do that. What about lip lacerations? Same kind of thing. Through and through lip lacerations need closure in the, in the front, in the back, in the middle, um, and uh, so it's going to have to take some time, make sure that you align the edges. Um, and especially if it's through the vermilion border of the lip, again, they need perfect alignment to do that. You know, it takes take time and experience to do that. Okay, um, talk about foreign bodies a little bit, you know, compared to that, that story I just told. So organic foreign bodies and wounds may cause infections, so they do need to be found and removed if at all possible. So, you know, we've all seen wounds that have, you know, large pieces of glass in there. You know, if you can see them, you can get rid of them. Um, sometimes if you get an x-ray, you can actually see some glass sometimes, but sometimes tiny fragments of glass you're not going to be able to see. So, but you still need to look. Um, the good news is that the, the, the really small parts of glass um, over time may, you know, may extrude out or, or dissolve. So, if you've got glass fragments in tight spaces like the fingers, again, we need to take the time, look for it, try to remove it. Um, and again, as we talked about earlier, assuring patients um, that all the foreign bodies you know, have been removed as much as we can. Um, but again, like in that story, you may be wrong, you know, but you can only do what you can only do. The problem with, with spending a lot of time, and in this case, you know, you wouldn't want to spend 30 minutes, 40 minutes with a pulsatile jet going in there searching and damaging tissue. So, you know, it's sort of a catch-22. So, best you can, look for those foreign bodies. Okay, 
So if a foreign body is suspected, um, you know, it's, it's important to order the correct study. We talked about x-rays. You know, it's becoming more common now to use some ultrasound. Um, you know, and you can see there, um, it's always nice to see an, something that has an arrow because then you know where you're looking. Um, but anyway, in, in the, the ultrasonography there, you, you can see a foreign body that's a toothpick. Um, so, so sometimes using an ultrasound at the bedside looking for foreign bodies is, is going to be better than just getting some plain x-rays. Okay, what about tongue lacerations? These are always hard. So consider closing the tongue if the laceration, you know, is large, if it's greater than one centimeter. Large gaping wounds of the tongue, um, especially at rest, they probably ought to be closed. Uh, also, if there's a lot of bleeding, obviously we need to close that as well, or if there's an anterior split tongue. So any of those things, obviously, sort of intuitively, um, those need to be closed. If they're smaller than that and the wounds aren't gaping, you may want to leave it alone. As you know, the, the, the good thing about the mouth is it takes care of itself pretty well. You know, the, the, the healing inside the mouth is really good if, sometimes if you just leave it alone. Okay, pu puncture wounds, really hard, you know. Um, there's, there's not a lot of studies out there about what to do. There's a lot of controversy. But, but anytime there's a foreign body, that, that particularly that goes into the foot, um, uh, you, you may need to, to, to core those puncture wounds out um, you know, to find whatever foreign body, particularly if it's something that's gone through a, a sock or a shoe or you know, uh, uh, anything that you're wearing on the foot because that pushes that foreign body further in. And, and if you try to dig in there, what happens? Sometimes you even push it in further. So you may need to get some sort of an imaging to see if something's in there. You may need to go after it. So the other problem is, you know, with these kind of, of puncture wounds is there can be some early infections. Um, it's usually staph. Um, the delayed infection is usually in weeks tends to be pseudomonas. So it's not really the standard of care to give quinolones uh, for sole of the foot puncture wounds, you know, but it, it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of, again, a catch-22 you know, in terms of trying to get the foreign body out and av avoid infections. Uh, other general wound repair tips. Make sure that you debris the devitalized tissue, the dead tissue that's there. You've got to be really careful if you're on the face, but you know, you've, got, you've got to, to close the fat and dead space that's in there, otherwise you're going to leave an open space uh, that leaves room for hematomas and, um, and, and infections, things like that. So. Um, optimal skin requires minimal tension on the skin edges. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but you may need some multi-layer layer repair to be able to make that work. We do know that, that buried absorbable uh, sutures really are foreign bodies, so, so we need to ma make those as, as less as we can. Um, monofilament absorbable sutures are associated with less bacteria in a wound than the multifilament. Okay, sutures. Sutures with tiny loops can really be difficult. I know, I know a lot of folks really like to take the time and put in really, really small, tight sutures. You know, I think that, that anybody that, that sutures a wound ought to be the person that takes out the sutures. <laughs> you know, and we've all seen sutures like, how am I going to get this out? I need, you know, a microscope to do it. So um, anyway, especially when, when you have to, to try, try to not rip them out and cause any more damage. Um, make sure that, that there's any crust formation, that we, that we remove that as best we can. Um, and uh, again, there's a picture there. That if the sutures are too tight, you, you may get with railroad tracks on there that's going to be permanent. So know that. Here's a, a great graph for your records, for your, for your, uh, to classifying suture material, the types and the generic structure and the classifications um, and the product. Uh, nice to have. Okay, let's talk a little bit about suturing. Um, you know, there's all different ways of suturing things, and it really depends on the wound. You know, this is a, a, a great and easy way uh, to, to close a wound, sort of a running subcuticular uh, using non-absorbable material. Um, and it's really a nice way to, uh, to bring the, the skin edges together, start at one end, tie a knot, go through in the circular fashion there, and tie a second knot. Um, and then you can also, you know, reinforce the areas with tape. It's easy to do, um, and, uh, and with a particular linear laceration like this, it works pretty well. So the running subcuticular suture, easy to do, and, and uh, it does bring the edges together pretty well. The simple and locking running sutures, you know, um, work really well. 
Um, you know, the, the cosmetic effect can really be exceptional. It takes a little longer to do this. Um, if, and the good thing about this is for some reason part of the wound gets infected, you can actually go in there and, and uh, cut part of the suture and pull part of it out while the rest remains intact. So uh, the simple and locking running sutures are valuable for that. Mattress sutures, really important if you're going to close deeper tissues within the skin. You can see there the horizontal mattress or the vertical mattress or the running continue uh, there. Um, this works really well if you have to go deep. And, and it's, as you know, it's really important to make sure that the, that the tissue underneath the skin also is brought together. Otherwise, you end up with hematomas or areas for infection. Um, look at this now. This is a pretibial flap laceration. You know, and what you f when you look at this initially, you think, oh, I'm just going to take my, my needle and I'm going to grab that top part of that and pull it over and, you know, it doesn't work. A and you have to really ask yourself, is it even worth trying to, la to suture up these? Um, really difficult to do. And what happens mostly with this, because the skin is so uh, thin here, is you just keep causing injuries to it. So sometimes just stereo stripping this is valuable. You see this in older, older folks. You see this in immunocompromised folks. So, you know, uh, and then the next one, I think, yeah, here's another one with, with, uh, with uh, V-shaped lacerations. Again, you sort of feel like you want to grab that, the top part of that V and pull it up. Um, again, it, it, it usually tears it's, and it has a, a lot of tension there and it's not very good. So, you, you know, you want to do corner stitches like it, it does here. Much sturdier, particularly in, in X-shaped wounds as well. The corner stitch also should be used. So that way, remember, it's all about tension. All right, staples. God's gift, isn't it? I tell you. I worked at, for, at, for uh, anybody from Arizona, I worked in Phoenix at Phoenix Memorial. The, we call it the Knife and Gun Club area. And uh, I would get called in at midnight, and they say, we need you to come in and, and staple some scalps for about six hours. You know, and uh, there's lots of people lined up with scalp lacerations. Most of them were actually pre-anesthetized, which is really nice. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. Okay. Uh, anyway, staples are great. Um, they, they're usually used, in, they can be used on the trunk and extremities. Most often they're used on the scalp, um, usually. And, and they, if you do them right, there's minimal scarring. So you've got to make sure that the wound edges are, are everted at equal heights, like in the picture here. And really, if you do that, fewer, fewer infections uh, than there is with sutures. So, you know, I, I mean, I love that when, when they first came out with, with staples. And, and easy to take out as well. Okay. Another God's gift is tissue glue. You know, uh, you, you, know you, you don't want to use it in high tension areas or areas that stay most, but like in this picture, um, perfect area. I have a good friend of mine who's a PA, called me one day, I was in the ER, he called me and said, um, you're not going to believe this, Randy, but I, uh, my son, who's, who's 10, was on his skateboard and he fell in the garage and got this laceration. He figured, okay, I'm a PA, I've got my little suture kit. So he took his son, put him on the kitchen table, got some syringe out, got a, some xylocaine, and he couldn't do it. He couldn't put a needle in his son's head. He goes, could you come by and take a look? So I, I brought some tissue glue home, you know, and, you know, 30 seconds, you know, was able to, to bring that together and put some tissue glue in there. It healed up great, no, no scar. The guy's like 27 now, and I'm still his hero. And uh, it was great. He sent me a nice little card. Thanks for fixing my head. Uh, but anyway, really great, great cosmetic effects. Um, and wound checks usually don't have to do. It does very well. The only thing that you need to do is don't put anything over it. Don't put any ointment or petroleum because it may dissolve the glue and, then, and, and uh, uh, just destroy the effects that you're trying to do. Okay, well, what about prophylactic wound antibiotics? A lot of controversy about that. The practice is really variable. Not a lot of data out there. So you should consider antibiotics in these, these things here. It, if it's an animal bite that you're suturing up, ought to consider it. If it's a heavily contaminated wound, like in the story I told you about the guy with the big gaping wound with lots of dirt and leaves in it, um, you ought to consider it, all, although in, this case, in that case it was a fungal infection, so a little different. Um, you know, anytime you've had devitalized tissue, um, we want to remove as much as possible, you know, but you ought to consider whether an antibiotic is going to be 
uh, important or not. Certainly open fractures like open tuft fractures, you got to consider that um, as well. Um, mouth lacerations, um, hand and foot lacerations, and certainly in the immunocompromised. I forgot to tell you that the guy that fell off the roof actually was on 20 milligrams of prednisone a day for a rheumatology disease. Um, so in retrospect, you shouldn't be surprised that the guy ended up having a fungal infection of his foot. Okay, following up. So the good news is that the incidence of wound infections in the ER is about 5%, so it's rare. Um, it's the lowest on the scalp and the face, the highest on the extremities, makes sense. That's you know, where the most exposure occurs. Um, we do know that patients are not a very good judge, you know, of whether there's an infection there. So a routine wound check is really important to, to, to look for wound infections. You know, patients can call and say, I think it's infected because it's red. Well, you look at it, it's just some normal erythema. So anyway, following up in two or three days is a good idea. Um, after the wound check, minimize scarring, um, making sure that the patient understands about removing crusts with a cotton-tipped applicator um, and applying, you know, polysporin or things like that um, it really helps to accelerate the, the healing. Um, we also tell the patient that once it's fully healed, you know, they want to use, should use some sunscreen to protect the area as well, um, avoiding other kinds of creams like vitamin E. Okay, here's a great suture removal guideline um, in terms of how, uh, uh, how long the sutures ought to be in. And basically, for, you know, if you start at the nose and move out, the further away from the nose you get, the longer the sutures ought to be in. And that bears out in here. Ought to consider splinting areas um, that need splinting uh, to, to reduce the amount of movement, um, and enhance uh, healing, uh, particularly in, in the extremities. Now, what about, lastly, we're going to talk about tetanus. So, Tetanus is fairly uncommon in the U.S. There's about 30 reported cases a year. Although I am a little bit concerned now with the anti-vaxxers out there who are, who are saying, you know, I'm not going to vaccinate my kids, I'm not going to vaccinate myself. Um, I'm really concerned. My, my uh, stepson, my wife's a nurse, I'm a PA. Our stepson uh, is an anti-vaxxer. He's got three kids, refuses to vaccinate them. You know, and we're saying, what, what did we do wrong? You know, he, and he's never been vaccinated, you know, and we're worried about that in terms of, you know, uh, increasing the, the problem with, with, uh, with the diseases that, that need to be vaccinated for. Um, anyway, nearly all the cases of tetanus happen with people who had never received a tetanus vaccine um, or somebody that doesn't stay up to date on the 10-year 10 10 booster rule. So um, here's some information about tet tetanus prophylaxis. Um, I actually, I think, I'm going to go to, to the graph. Here's the graph. This is probably the thing that you want to use in terms of clean and minor wounds, in terms of, of whether you ought, ought to be giving a, a tetanus vaccine or, uh, or a prophylaxis. And uh, I think this is good information to, to, to use. So again, and, and I don't know about you, but a lot of patients don't remember when their last tetanus shot was. They don't, you know, we, we try to encourage them to you know, keep a record now with, you know, with smartphones, you can keep it on your phone, you know, but a lot of people don't remember whether it's been 10 years or 20 years or five years. So, but best we can in looking, looking at the kind of wound that it is in terms of risk. So um, it, anyway, tetanus important component. I think that was it. And I think Ken's up next talking, yep. Thank you very much. Uh,